you know, personality has really no place on the path of Vardenkar. It just gets in the way. Whether it's my personality or the personality of Ribas or Tars, the Apple Sakabi, or your personality. We're really, <clears throat> we're not focusing on the personality or the little self or the ego self. We're focusing on the higher things such as soul and God, the Hure, and spirit or what's known as the Varden. And when I say focusing, really it comes down to attention and awareness. It's not, I mean, initially we may focus on on reading and contemplating and well, putting our attention on, on it. <clears throat> Perhaps we, we, we have to use the mind. And the emotions and the physical body and all this stuff while we're on the lower worlds. But ultimately, none of that really matters. Um, as we learn to leave our bodies, we begin to have the experience or awareness of the self-realized state of being pure soul and the the Atma Lok and above, we become, we realize that we are a point of awareness. We're an eternal God being and that we know through direct perception. We know, I've, no, I've said this a thousand times and sometimes I wonder if it falls on, I was going to say deaf ears, um, but just that until the individual experiences this, there's always going to be this doubt. There's always going to be this wondering whether this is true or not, whether it's real, whether the master's real. So first thing I want to say is that the personalities, the outer physical manifestations, I'm not going to say they don't matter, but... Just as the human body allows soul to express itself in the physical world, um, so the human body acts as a, a way of soul expressing itself in these coarse vibrations, all of these um, personalities, lower parts of us, People get so, a lot of people get caught up in all of this, they don't realize that none of it really is the point. It kind of reminds me a bit of the analogy of the of the door. You know, the master says to the chila or student, go through the door. So the chila walks up to the door, and the master says, in in." If you open the door and you step through the door, you'll enter a much larger room or state of consciousness. And the chila walks up to the door, but then he looks at the door and he says, you know, <clears throat> this door is kind of um, beaten up. Uh, first of all, the wood on this door is very rough. And the, and the master's going, yes, well, <clears throat> that's true. Um, do you want to go through the door? And she says, well, hold on a second. Um, the doorknob is really dirty and it's tarnished. And Well, you get the picture. So the chila becomes enamored with the door or doesn't like the door and thinks that the, there's something wrong with the door and he forgets <laughs> that the door is uh, not the point. Also reminds me a little bit of the famous poem that Rami, Rumi wrote about this the garden, this, this beautiful secret sacred garden and how the wall around the garden was purposely unkempt. But the garden itself, once you went through the wall, you know, opened the gates and went in, then the garden was absolutely stunning. 
but the um, outside was purposely designed to to get people to think, oh, why would I go here? And now this is symbolic. This is symbolic of the... Well, it's kind of obvious if you're following me. Maybe not. But um, I don't want to beat a dead horse here. So we're going to be talking about a few things, but one of them is skepticism. And... Um, and also the struggles that the that the true seeker goes through in order to find the illuminated states or the elevated states of awareness and eventually culminating in, in total awareness, which is actually a misnomer because there's always another step to take. There's always a higher plane. But when we speak of total awareness, we're talking about Entering into these very, very high planes, um, into the the tenth, eleventh, twelfth, even thirteenth, fourteenth, and of course there are more than this. But we're really, we're really talking about God realization, which starts on the tenth and ends, and it, it moves into the twelfth. And of course there are always higher levels. We're not talking about dimensions, by the way. We're talking about planes, and there's a God worlds chart. And I always say this in my talks. Probably, if there's a video, you can see it now, hopefully. And if not, you can go to vardenkar.com, V A R D A N K A R.com, and you can see the God World's turn. I apologize, everybody. It's seen it a million times. But this skepticism um, is an interesting thing. Um, the seeker is going to go, the true God seeker is going to go through a lot of struggles. And a lot of testing. And there's no way to avoid these moments of doubt. And and this is just part of the path. And so, now, I have to say something. The There's a difference between the true God-seeker and the person who's just, you know, looking for entertainment or, you know, skept they're skeptical to the point, but they don't really care. Now, it's tricky because sometimes soul will want to return, but the lower bodies aren't aware of this. So it's a kind of a conundrum. And really, the person has to have a sufficient desire, and it, can't, it has to be long-lasting. They have to have this burning, long-lasting desire to find truth, to find God. Now, whether they call it God or they call it truth, there's a part of them that wants to return, and the chila or student is is um, chosen by God or the hure to return to it as soul, eternal. Now, soul, as I said, was a unit of awareness as a three hundred sixty degree viewpoint. It's identical in substance to the voice of God, the Varden. Uh, Paul G used to call it the Ek. And this Varden is, or Holy Spirit, as the Christians call it, is comes down as this light and sound. But it can be very subtle. And as we move down in, into the lower worlds, we take on these these coarse bodies, and the vibe, we begin to mix spirit with matter and mind stuff. And as it gets denser and denser and denser. Uh, more and more solid, more and more matter, and less and less spirit, we finally end up at this point where we have these physical bodies, which are very solid compared to <laughs> compared to the other planes above it. And um, we end up with these coarse vibrations. Now, the inner worlds, even even the astral plane, which is fairly low, it's only the second plane, are more subtle. There's less matter, less mind stuff, more spirit. But the astral plane is still pretty low, but it's certainly, parts of it are certainly much higher in vibration than the physical. And um, a lot of occult groups, psychic groups, even groups that call themselves spiritual, 
are actually having experiences on these different levels or subplanes within the astral plane, and they confuse this for dimensions and and uh, I guess you could call them dimensions if you want, but they're not what we're talking about when we talk about different planes. But each plane has many different um, areas within it, or subplanes, regions, I should say. Just like the physical has many regions, many galaxies, many planets, many places and cities. And the physical even has what's called the super physical. They're different vibrations. There's a whole spectrum of vibratory rates. Um, I know it sounds a little complicated. It's a little bit like the electromagnetic spectrum uh, or, or radio, AM, FM radio, where you tune the dial. And as you go up in frequency, you suddenly are hearing stations that you couldn't hear before because they were at a lower frequency in the radio on the FM spectrum or the AM radio band. If you want to call it a band, I guess that's the proper term. Um, and so some of these experiences can be very subtle. And if one is trying to use the outer senses, the physical eyes, the physical hearing, if they're if they're tuning in, so to speak, on a radio that's not tuned to that vibration. It's tuned to a lower vibration, a coarser vibration, then they're not going to perceive or be as aware of these subtle things as they would if they were able to open up. What we have is we have the, what's called the spiritual eye, the third eye, just retil. And that's the beginning. That's just the beginning of, of perception. It's not that high, but it's the beginning of the inner perception. And I'm not really saying this very well at all but we have all these worlds within worlds we have the microcosm and the macrocosm and they're actual planes like i said if you look at the godwell's chart now the doubts are normal in a lot of cases there's several reasons many reasons one is it's a test to see the sincerity of, of the seeker whether the seeker is a true seeker or they just have some kind of casual um interest or fascination with the subject or whether they're for real, whether they're committed, whether they're sincere or not sincere. Gee, you know, this is such a big subject, and there's so many different states of consciousness that I'm addressing that it's kind of, <laughs> be honest with you, it's a little, it's a little bit overwhelming. To, um, and I sometimes I I don't know what to say because there's so much to say. But uh, I can't say it all at once. I wish I could. But this, um, <laughs> so I know I'm starting to sound very strange. Well, it could be because it's almost six in the morning. But, um, but with all hu humor aside, there's this tremendous struggle. And perception st or the state of awareness becomes a big thing. And now we have, we have divine imagination or imagination and we have attitude and beliefs we have these beliefs that people possess and this all comes into the heading of this of the individual's state of consciousness which connects with their karmic patterns past life patterns their karma um, and this includes their family karma nat national karma individual karma many different types of karma and the individual comes down with certain handicaps certain karmic conditions now i'll say right up front that soul coming down into the lower worlds is an automatic handicap when soul takes on a mind or a mental body on the on the mental plane it's a it's an automatic handicap soul is in enemy territory this is not our natural state in our natural state, soul knows through direct perception. It has seeing, knowing, and being. It's omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. We are basically gods among other gods. Now, when we take on these lower bodies, like the mental body, it's at a lower vibration. And this is there's a certain danger in these psychic worlds. And that is that the individual becomes enamored by the power in these lower worlds, which is a, a, pow a dual power. And the individual can get trapped if they abuse this power. 
if they if they seek this power and it's a very strange phenomena a lot of people have been burned by their own desire for power and control and it's very easy to to generate karma here negative karma um there's a lot of spiritual laws pertaining to to not interfering the law of non-interference and so souls accumulate karma they accumulate good karma they accumulate bad karma and all this stuff and we go through these many many millions actually of reincarnation incarnations and we have all kinds of experiences unbelievable variety of experiences so by the time we are ready to return to the godhead we've been through an amazing number of experiences that vary from from the lowest to the highest i've talked about this before you know from being a, a thief to being a policeman to from being a murderer to being a, a nun and a priest and running a soup kitchen to hurting people or torturing people and all all these things that really we don't want to talk about for good reason um both so-called good and both so-called bad but we reach a point where we begin to transcend that and we begin to realize that we want to walk the middle path we've tried the path of death and destruction of of the the evil path of, of trying to control people and and steal and kill and rage war and all of these in greed and attachment and vanity and we go through that to some degree as soul moves through these cycles and we've tried the path the positive so-called positive path of feeding bodies helping people help healing the sick and all of this and we've made some good karma in some ways and we begin to realize that karma is karma and that although it's certainly preferable to to do, make good karma not bad karma um that's certainly desirable that it's all part of the system of the wheel of 84 of transmigration or reincarnation where we just go from embodiment to embodiment to embodiment and there are many of these lower planes they have bodies just like the astral body or the causal body or the mental body or the etheric body these are all sheaths which cover soul at a lower vibration they're all in a sense prisons and so by the time the individual gets down to the physical soul is contained within the physical body the astral body the causal body the mental body and the etheric body and these are all sheaths one inside the other inside the other inside the other and this all exists simultaneously and it almost seems hopeless until you understand that soul itself is a happy entity that has this 360 degree viewpoint it knows through direct perception and soul does not exist in time and space you see and so this is where attitude becomes a major thing attitude and beliefs because soul's natural has a natural ability to place its attention or its awareness upon any plane or many planes at the same time and it can learn to do this through the art of vardenkar the ancient science of out of body soul projection or soul travel or, or tuza travel whatever term you want to call it now in the lower worlds we travel because there's movement there's time and space as we reach beyond the lower worlds and we go beyond matter energy space and time into the fifth plane or the atma lok and beyond see that we enter into this projection where we're simply putting our attention or our awareness because we're already there you see this is what i'm trying to say now the problem is the individual if the individual is very grounded in the physical awareness in the senses the five senses um they're going to sometimes their spiritual hearing their inner spiritual hearing and their inner sight uh through the through the third eye and and so forth are are um not i don't know how to quite put this right they're not as open as they could be to this to this 
And so they are not able to be as aware as they would like to be. And so they'll do exercises, whether it's meditation, contemplation, in Vardhankar we do spiritual exercises, and the amount of awareness that the individual possesses, the amount of, of, of um, perception or awareness they have, and their state of consciousness can be limited in, in many different ways, through a negative attitude, through negative beliefs. Um, and so you, I guess what I'm trying to say is you can't think your way into these higher states. It really has to be done through this soul projection. And there are methods. Now, meditation is a dismal failure for the most part. The reason is because these vibrations, these states of awareness, don't descend into the human state, into the physical consciousness. That's like taking a radio and tuning it to a particular frequency and then waiting for the station, which is at, let's say, a much higher frequency on the band, to descend down to your frequency that you're tuning the radio to. So you're waiting for the radio station to take all its transmitters or transmitter and lower its its broadcast frequency so that you can pick it up because you don't want to change the the dial on the radio or maybe you don't have the correct radio to to receive the the, the um, station. Maybe you have an AM radio and you need an FM radio but you don't have an FM radio so you're waiting for the radio AM the FM radio station, to lower its vibrations so you can pick up the station and listen to it. Well, it don't work that way. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You see, it's kind of silly. It sounds really silly when I use that analogy. But you've got these people sitting there for hours doing meditation. And um, it's been, for the most part, with few exceptions, it's it's been mostly a failure. Now, those individuals that do manage to have experiences often are, are actually leaving their bodies to some degree. You see. But this is always, Tusa travel or soul projection has always been the most direct path back to God or the Hue Ray as we call it because it's, it's, it's simply, this is the way it's worked. It's always worked this way. And nobody has invented it. You know, it's very amusing when people say, uh, for example, Paul Paul Twitchell, Sri Paul Twitchell, stole it from some other path that's only been around for 100 or 200 years or whatever, and he stole it from them. Well, really? <laughs> well, Paul G was very clear, and I've talked about this before, he was very clear in the Spiritual Notebook and his other writings and talks that this is an ancient path that's had many names, it's many masters from many different races and even planets. And this goes way back, way, way back. And there's always been a way for soul to return. There's always been a direct path. And the path has had many names, but it's always been this path of bilocation or soul projection or whatever terminology you want to use, where, where soul learns by its own volition to move into these higher states. And these higher states are real. Now, the Varna Masters, and they do exist, um, I'm actually one of them. Um, how do I put this? Without... The Varna Masters have been to these various planes. And people say, well, how, how do you know this is true? Or how do you know that's true? Well, you, you, you gain these things through personal experience. And there are what they call, we often call them the spiritual travelers. And there are some that are quite um, experienced or older masters who still have physical bodies. Some of them like Yabal Sakabi and Reba Zartars. Reba Zartars is over 550 years old in the same body. Now he's there for a reason in that body because he has a, a spiritual mission that requires him to, to be in the physical for X number of years, and eventually he'll retire from this plane of existence and um, move into whatever area he, he desires, because he's earned that. But for now, he's here in the physical world, 
Now, when I say here, I almost it's tongue in cheek because he's really everywhere, anywhere he wants to be, or multiple places. And this is the this is the delightful part of the one of the delightful parts of the whole thing is that soul is not limited by time or space. And talk about mind blowing, or you know, if, especially if you're not familiar with this, it's really quite literally liberating to know that you're not tied into these limitations. And yet, this is the great paradox: is that in a sense we are in the physical, we are tied to certain limitations, and yet we are not. And this is the great dilemma. You know, if we are with God, then why do we go through these great, great, great struggles and doubts? What, why the doubts? And this is the great paradox of the lower worlds. And everything in the lower worlds is opposites. Where there's love, there must be hate. Where there's mountains, there must be valleys. And you could go on and on and on infinitum. Where there's light, there's dark, darkness. And this is the nature of the dual worlds, the worlds of duality. Not all the planes are like this. Only the lower worlds have this duality. Only the lower worlds contain matter, energy, space, and time. Once you reach past the lower worlds and you reach into the great void, which is the separator that separates the lower worlds from the higher worlds, uh, which is often confused for, like some some call it nirvana, um, some will say it's God realization, and they'll say God is nothing, we're all one. This is great area of darkness, which is also paradoxically an area of great light, and it's sort of a gate or a fence, or a moat, as you could say, that, that separates the true first of the pure positive God worlds, which is the soul plane or Atma Lok, from the etheric plane, which is the high the highest part of the mental plane. And in between this, as we descend into these lower worlds, through this great void, as soul descends, the positive and the negative it it splits into these two forces. And of course there's the neutral. So Vardenkar is the middle path. Now the individual has these great struggles and some it can reach the point of what is known as the dark night of soul where the person feels that nothing they do is right, that the master has abandoned them, that God has abandoned them, and there's no hope. This is known as the dark night of soul. It can be a very, very difficult period of time and it can vary in how long it, it occurs. And these are things that all souls go through on their on their way back to the to the to these the high state of self-realization, God realization, and beyond that into mastership. And, and there are many, many different levels, and they're at, these are actual worlds upon worlds. These aren't just um, metaphysical concepts or ideas or or artistic expressions, these are actual places. Uh, if you can call it a place, because there's no matter, matter, energy, space, or time, but they are worlds that are much more real than than this one. Anybody who's ever actually gone there for any significant, had any kind of significant deep experience there, no know, knows this. But f unfortunately, f few have. At least in this world, few have. But it is possible. So this doubt and the skepticism and the, and the this these dark nights of soul and all these things are are in a way you could say tests. Palji used to say, and of course I agree with him, that um, only a deep what did he say? See now I've forgotten. Only a deep burning desire for God will do. You can't have a, a, a fleeting, casual desire for God. It has to be deep and long-lasting. And, and this kind of summarizes it, because when the tests come, you know, the student will fail if they're not sufficiently motivated to go through 
what they have to go through. Now, it's kind of funny. Um, I, I reluctantly bring this up a little bit, but it is kind of amusing. I was watching a documentary about um, Navy SEAL training. I can't remember the name of the documentary. It was actually kind of eye-opening. And it talked about what these men go through um, who are being trained to be Navy SEALs. Now, they're already in the Navy. They've already been through all the basic training and all this stuff. Some of them have been in the Navy for years and years and years. So this is like the top Navy people who are now want to be Navy SEALs. And the level of difficulty of the training is, you know, quite amazing. I mean, they're they're swimming in freezing water for a mile, and they're, it's just like, and and just to give you an idea of how bad it is or how difficult it is, I think they start with ninety people, and four days later it's down to fifty. People are quitting, and <laughs> they're literally mostly quitting. It's so hard. These are tough guys. These are military Navy guys who are in really good shape. Apparently, it, I mean, it's extremely... Anyway, I was watching this and I'm like, wow. You know, I had no idea how difficult this training was. I mean, I wouldn't... <laughs> I'm a couch potato. I wouldn't last two minutes. Um, but, um, and I've got health problems. But, uh, I, you know, it was quite eye-opening. I didn't watch... The, all the parts, but what's enough of it to be, wow, man, this is really interesting stuff. Um, <laughs> just like, wow, talk about effort and, and just sheer determination and um, overcoming fear and overcoming, um, uh, anyway, I go on and on about, it, but it's not, it's not that important. It's the point is that there's going to be obstacles and it's going to take effort and if one is lost and has no destination, if, if the truth seeker has to be able to develop this inner sense of knowingness, and often this inner sense of knowingness comes through this strong desire, well, to know. Now I say often it's, it, they have to have this desire for God. But I'm not talking about the lower God, you know, the, the Santa Claus God or the God that looks like a man with a white robe. That's really a lower world God. That's the Brahm, um, which is a deity, which is not God, but he's a God ruler. He's not a God ruler. He's a, he's a um, lower world's ruler. And uh, he basically, or it, if you want to say correctly, is... Um, is kind of like a um, clearinghouse or a transformer for all the power that sustains all the, the worlds from his world all the way down. And so, obviously, he's extremely powerful because everything, it's this consciousness, it's this sustaining force, and he's like this clearinghouse for all of this, a transformer. Because as this spiritual power moves down, in vibration, there's another ruler which acts to, to sustain those worlds. It acts as a as a um, transformer to, I don't know what other words to use. It's very difficult to describe this. But um, each of these worlds have a ruler. Each of the lower worlds have a ruler. And this ruler is actually the, this energy. It's a tremendous soul. Uh, or being, but it can appear in different ways to different people. And um, one of the things I have to say about the lower worlds is there's a tremendous amount of illusion, or what's called Maya. And there's a dreamlike quality to the lower worlds, and it's very easy to be fooled and confused. And this is one of the great tests that occur for the aspirant who desires to find God and for the chila who's initiated is, is moving through all of this. The truth seeker has a barrage of obstacles and difficulties. It's funny, the, the YouTube video I was watching or the, the documentary I was watching, um, the obstacles that these men had to face were, were pretty severe. Um, I, I didn't realize how, you know, wow. Um, so 
but that's actually in some ways nothing compared to what the truth seekers faces. And it it's not physically, um, obviously, in most cases, but the need for a master becomes very obvious. The student, spiritual student, when choosing a master, has to re- recognize that a, a master or guru or spiritual teacher can only take you to whatever plane that master, teacher, or guru has has um, reached himself or herself. And this is a very, very important point. So this is this is the problem, is that we there are many different teachers and masters and so-called masters and gurus um, who will... M- at most, bring their students to whatever level they've reached. And most of them, frankly, haven't haven't gotten past the mental plane, or in many cases, the the um, astral or causal plane. And they don't realize this. So there's this tremendous Maya or illusion that takes place in these worlds, and the individual is faced with a m- m- myriad of of traps and and eddies and 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 all kinds of ways of getting caught in a particular state of consciousness, a particular attitude, a particular... um, The mind works as a machine. It works in grooves. And so the mind will just go around and around and around. And then you've got all these engrams, which are um, patterns of energy that have been accumulated from vast amounts of past lives. A lot of them have been worked out, of course, but some of them still are there. And they follow these patterns. So somebody, one of these engrams gets activated. If so, a crude example of somebody's afraid of water, and they don't know why they're afraid of water, and then they, um, of course, they're never going to be a Navy SEAL. I'm just joking. Um, but uh, they're afraid of water, so they, and they don't know why. And it could be that something as simple as, as they drowned in a past life, and this created a very. Um, strong impression on them um, and this created an engram it's a, it's a, like almost like a holographic packet of energy now when you put your attention on one of these engrams um, then it, it, it's like it like a hologram when you put a laser through the hologram it all of a sudden appears real it becomes real it, it activates it or taking an electric motor as long as the motor has no electricity coming through it it's it's just a piece of metal, but the second you put the electricity through it, it suddenly starts moving. So, so you've got all these these um, the lower worlds are basically designed to keep soul in them as long as possible until soul's um, desire for God becomes so strong, and basically it's had so many experiences that it just wants to graduate and 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 return to, to the Godhead. You know, I'm. It sounds like I'm oversimplifying it, but sometimes I think it's really soul is chosen at some point by God or the Hure to 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 return to it. Now, soul. When I say soul is is chosen, not notice I didn't say the, the astral body is chosen to return to God or the physical body is chosen to return to God. God doesn't care, frankly, about any of these lower bodies. See, they're just temporary. They're like Dixie cups. They're there so that we have the vehicles or the tools we need to have these various experiences. And some of these experiences are are very difficult. See, the whole lower world is a school. It's a training ground so that soul can become aware and conscious so that it can take its rightful place as a conscious co-worker with the Hure or God, take its place in eternity and become a conscious co-worker and at that point, soul can take on various duties, which it um, can choose based upon its interests and its spiritual mission. And so some people become angels, some people become cherubs, planetary spirits, even you know masters, silent ones. There are many different jobs throughout these different worlds. Now... The lower worlds are, are, are um, how can I put this, are different than the higher worlds in, in many respects. 
many of the beings within the lower worlds are unaware of um, the higher worlds. And so you, in fact, pretty much m almost all of them, the exception are, are um, obviously the Varden Masters, but a, a being can only bring you or guide you as far as it, it, it's, act, its actual state of awareness is at, where it's established itself. And this is, very, like I said, is very important. So when somebody is, is, is speaking with an angel who's, let's say, on the astral plane, um, and that angel is centered on that plane, then this is about as far as, as the angel is going to be able to take them. Um, so this is something to keep in mind. This is a very important point. Now, the other point I want to make, I know some of this is a bit esoteric or abstract to some people, but the other point I want to make is that this cosmic consciousness occurs on on various, in between each of the planes. Like, for example... At the very highest part of the astral, there's this cosmic consciousness, and it's a state of feeling like you're at one with with everyone and everything in all life, and it's this feeling of unity, like we're all part of this great whole, and um, there's this tremendous feeling of love, and and people reach this state of cosmic consciousness on these various, in between these various planes, and they think that they've reached this very 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 high state. And um, often they, they declare themselves a guru and they mistake in this for self-realization or even God-realization, you see. And so there's a lot of traps and there's a void or a area of cosmic consciousness between, the, uh, between each of the planes. So literally at the very height of the physical plane, there's a state of cosmic consciousness at the very heights of the astral plane, right before we go into the causal, there's this... It's, I guess you could describe it as a universal astral consciousness. Now, as we get higher, the we have at the very high mental, there's a cosmic consciousness which takes place, um, which some people call it the mind of God or the universal mind power. And there's many different books that talk about this. So there's many, many, many numerous states of consciousness, which just creates a lot of confusion. Now, some people, they're so shut down in their awareness for different for various reasons that they don't perceive this, any of this, but it's okay, and this is what I'm trying to say here, it's okay because the individual often is not ready yet, but they will be if they're patient and if they have this great desire for God, the master will take them via the exercises and via the initiations through these various levels, and they will become aware, given the time, sufficient time and effort, they will become aware. And this is a natural process, and it's nothing to be... Uh, we don't judge one another, you know, just like we don't judge a first grader and say he's stupid, um because he's at that particular level at that particular time, and we know that as long as we treat him right and um, he has a good attitude, that that he will move through the various grades and eventually become an adult and and pursue whatever it is that he wants to pursue. You see, we don't we don't worry about that too much because we know that nature will take its course given the, the amount of time. Now, if he were to suddenly quit school, say, you know, I can't figure this multiplication stuff out. I don't understand it. I don't want to understand it. I give up. And he stops that process. Then, of course, you know, he, he may never learn to read. Or maybe he will. But it's going to take a certain amount of effort on his part, a certain amount of time, uh, and concerted effort and study in order to reach whatever level of attainment that he desires to reach and this is just common sense but in the spiritual uh, religion and metaphysics and all these things have sold the public on this idea of microwave spirituality you know you pop it in the oven and two minutes later it's done <laughs> and it's it's 
kind of sad. It's it's actually a tremendous disservice to those that are looking for 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 enlightenment, looking for for self realization, God realization. They're looking for truth, and they're being sold this bill of goods. Frankly, it's all easy. It's all all you gotta do is this, this quick thing. And you just throw it in the microwave, and three minutes later, you got a hot meal, and it's going to be nutritious and delicious and great for you, and it's not going to make you sick. You're going to be happy with it, you know. And, uh, well, it doesn't work that way. You know, now the person, the individual may get some kind of experience. You know, they may do it, and some technique that's real easy and fast, and, and they may um, achieve some you know, they might have some kind of astral experience or whatever experience they have. But in the long run, in the long run, they're not going to reach truth. They're not going to reach enlightenment. It's simply, they're going to reach something. Um, but, you know, you hit yourself on the head with a mallet and you probably reach something. <laughs> you know, <laughs> fall over backwards and you'll probably have some kind of experience. But, um, what that is is another story entirely. So we have different levels of those that seek truth, and I've talked about this in other talks. The masses really don't want truth. You see, they're not seeking God. They might say they are, but they're not really truly seeking it. So the sincerity becomes a big thing, and also being able to let go of your cherished opinions and beliefs. And so I wish I could say this was easy, and I wish I could say I had some kind of microwave answer for you. But, you know, I've, I've, there are some simple techniques you can use. Um, I have a, a video or audio on that, talk on that. Uh, I think it's called something like a simple spiritual exercise. Um, but, and, and that certainly can help. That can, there are things you can do to get started. But it's going to come down to the spiritual exercises of Vardenkar. And studying the discourses and studying the program, and um, whether that's something that's of interest to you or not is entirely up to you. We have books um, that are on sale on Amazon. We have a couple of free books on the website. We have lots and lots of of, vi of videos on YouTube, and we have audios. Um, there's a lot of material that's free. Some of it costs some money. Um. So there's definitely other steps in, in this process. And it is a process, and it takes time, and it takes effort. But it is real, I can assure you of that. Now, this doubt and skepticism comes in, and the individual has to prove it for themselves. Now, if they have a negative attitude, if they have a fatalistic attitude, um, it's going to be much more difficult for them to prove it to themselves and if they have a positive attitude, you see, there are different levels of skepticism. There's what some people call healthy skepticism, and then there's other kinds of skepticism which maybe aren't so healthy. But even amongst healthy skepticism, it's it's a kind of a two-edged sword, you know. Especially when you're doing the exercise, that's the worst time to have so-called healthy skepticism or skepticism is while one is doing the exercise. You see, you always have time later on, if you have an experience, to to reflect upon it and, and, and ask questions and decide, you know, was this real, was it not real? But when you're having the experience, the problem is the experience is dynamic. You see, it's happening, and if, for example, in the middle, in the beginning of the experience, you're... you're you're skeptical of what's happening, then it's like shooting it down. You know, it doesn't have a chance to grow. It's like it's like if a plant started to grow and you stomped on it. You know, it's, it's it, I know it sounds ridiculous, but this is what people do all the time. You know, they start to they they start to do an exercise and then they start to have an experience. And the second they have the experience, the first thought is. How do I know this is real? That could be my imagination. <laughs> and then, well, you know what happens next. Now they're placing their attention upon that, upon doubt. 
and then all of a sudden the experience stops uh, or it freezes and now they're like, wait a minute why did it stop what what's going on now oh wow i was right it was imagination i didn't, well, I didn't really see that it was just my imagination it wasn't real you know and it's pretty funny because had they had they gone with it really what we have to do is we have to have a childlike expectancy you know children have this natural most children that are growing up in a healthy environment have a tremendous imagination and they have this childlike expectancy you know you ask a child what they're going to do for a living they'll tell you like i'm, I'm going to be an astronaut i'm going to, I'm going to be a a, f a f ball player, baseball player, professional baseball player, you know, and you know, the adults are like, oh, that's cute, you know, yeah, right, you know, um, good luck with the astronaut job, you know, um, you know, if I had a dollar for every child that said that, I, boy, I'd be rich, and uh, oh, yeah, and the professional baseball player, right, you know, like, dream on, you know, you're not tall enough, or, or yeah, your odds are one in a million, you know, um, but the child doesn't think like that at all. It doesn't. The child doesn't even think. It just, just there's this childlike expectancy. Well, when you're doing a spiritual exercise, and not everybody, I guess, knows what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about meditation. Um, I'm talking about contemplation. Uh, and the different spiritual exercises you can do. There are many of them in the discourses. Some are in the books. But um, you're doing a spiritual exercise. It's really important. Um, to um, or when you're trying to do uh, out of body travel, out of body projection, it's very important to have to have this childlike expectancy, and to be very grateful of any experience you have, and not to shoot it down with like, wait a minute, was that real? You know, was that real? Am I, is this really happening? I I gave this uh, joke once. I think I think I put it in a talk, but it's a bit, or I might have written something about it. But it's a bit like, you know, if a master were to knock on your door. And you open the door, and you said to the master, Well, it looks like Rebbe Zartars is standing at my door, but I think it's my imagination. Hey, it's got to be my imagination. And then you slam the door in his face. <laughs> you know? And then he knocks on the door again. And you're like, oh, it's knock. I hear a knock again. What's that? You open the door, and again, you see Rebbe Zartars. And you close the door and you say, I can't believe this. My imagination... You know, the only reason I'm seeing him is because I was reading something about him an hour ago, and now I'm imagining him. He's knocking on my door. It's ridiculous. He's not, you know, well, eventually he's going to go away. You know, he's not going to stand there forever and knock on your door. Um, and th I know this sounds silly, but this is really the way it sometimes it works. It's sometimes that, that simple... You know, we're having, we we see a master or we feel the presence of a master. Oh, no, that, you know, I can't. That, this is my imagination. This can't be real. I'm not really, it's not really happening. And, and then that's the end of the experience, you see. It's like slamming the door and slam the door on somebody's face. And then you knock on the door and you open it again. And you slam it back in their face. Eventually, they're just going to walk away and say, okay. He doesn't want to see me. He doesn't believe I'm. Here, so I'm going. I'm not going to stand here like an idiot for four hours and knock on his door. If he doesn't want to see me, I won't see him. And then see this re this is self reinforcing because now, <laughs> well, you get the picture. Now the you know is the person going to keep coming back every day and knocking on your door if you slam it in their face? No, you know they're going to say, well, it's kind of like well they're probably going to think what an idiot. But um. But no, it's not that we're... Well, we are kind of being idiotic when we do things like that. But I understand when we've been burned so many times. And the nature of truth in the lower worlds is, the, is that there is this illusion. And so, yes, we, we face these paradoxes. And we have to be very bold, adventurous, cunning, and resourceful and brave. We have to have these qualities at some point or develop these qualities at some point because there's going to be all these challenges. And yes, we're going to be thrown all kinds of illusions. And we have to be bold enough and will, willing to, to fail and fail and fail and fail and go through all kinds of blind alleys to get to the, to the truth. I remember, um, I remember when I was studying sales a long time ago and, and 
you know, Vardenkar is not about sales. If you, if you, I mean, you could tell by my talks. I'm not trying to. If I wanted to recruit people into Vardenkar, I'd be talking about how much money they could make and how God's going to give them everything they ever wanted. But, but you can tell I'm not doing that. So, but when I studied sales a long time ago, you know, there, there were certain things you you learn. Obviously, you tell people what they want to hear, which I'm not doing for you, I'm sure. But um, <laughs> I don't even remember what the point I was going to make was. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I got off on a tangent. I do that sometimes. Well, there has so has to be this sense of humor, you know, because when life does get very difficult, um, especially if we're a true God seeker and things get tough, if we don't have a sense of humor, if we can't laugh at ourselves, um, and I laugh at myself all the time, then we're in big trouble, you know, because when things get hard, they're going to get hard. And it's really, this ties into the subject of introversion. When a person is absorbed, and I speak from experience on a lot of this stuff, um, from my own experience, <laughs> embarrassingly so, but when a person becomes self-absorbed in their own self, in their own little self, their own problems, you know, the, the me, 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 uh, this introversion takes place and the individual can often stagnate or freeze and they become introverted, meaning they keep, it's like looking in a mirror, you just keep saying, Is, do I have a pimple on my nose? I don't know if I have a pimple on my nose. Oh no, look at this, you know. And, and so that the person becomes so in this loop it's like if you've ever done any if you ever heard a sound system where it goes into a feedback loop and it makes that howling noise that really annoying you know wolf like you know it gets louder and and the audio engineer is frantically trying to turn the volume down or somebody's trying to turn the volume down or disconnect the mic um it's because there's a feedback loop and the and the uh, speaker the sound from the speaker when, when you speak into the mic it goes into the microphone, and then it comes out the speaker, and then the speak the microphone, if the speaker is too loud, the microphone starts picking up on the sound from the speaker, and then it pumps it into the speaker again, and it forms this loop. So somebody might say something like, hello, and all of a sudden it keeps going because it's going in a loop. And the only answer is, well, is I'm not an audio engineer, but I know a little bit about it, but the only answer is really to turn down the volume of the speaker or to move the mic away from the speaker. I mean, there's a few things you can do, but the point is that it's going around and around and around. So when the individual becomes self-absorbed, um, this can happen and they become frozen. And so the answer is to take your attention off of yourself. And how you do that almost doesn't really matter. I mean, watch a movie. I mean, you could read a book, a uh, Varden book, but the idea is to is to not be so self-absorbed and to relax. And humor is one of the ways to do that. If we can laugh at ourselves, laugh at our foibles, this will help with doubt because really the door opens inwardly. And so if we're pushing on the door, pushing on the door, pushing, you know, come on, I want to have an experience. I want to have an experience. I have all this doubt. Come on. I want an experience so I can get rid of the doubt. I want to have an experience. You know, we're pushing on the door and, and we become more and more introverted with it and more and more self-analytical and, and, and we become self-absorbed and, and we're thinking about myself. I want to have an experience. I want to have an experience. Push, you know, push, push, push. And then it doesn't happen and we're discouraged. I'm not going to have an experience. Why aren't I having an experience? Maybe this isn't real. You know, you get into that self-absorption, um, introversion stuff and it's like you're pushing on this door, but the door opens in you have to back away. You see, you have to relax. And this is one of the funny things about being a God seeker or cliffhanger is that sometimes we do have to push. We have to go through these moments of soul searching and we push and we cry and things can get rough. And uh, But then at some point... There's this process of, of backing away from the door. And sometimes we may give up for a few days or a few weeks. Uh, we might back off. But the question is, are we going to go back, back? Or are we just going to blame the master and say, this doesn't work. I give up. Or, or, or blame ourselves. I'm not good at this. You know, I can't do this. 
So it's really it comes back to a long lasting burning desire for God. So boy, I've covered a lot of things. I don't know how much of this has been helpful for anybody. Hopefully it has. Um, I, there's so much to this. I have an enormous amount of respect for those that are skeptical, but I've also seen people become their own worst enemies. And one of the things I've seen, having done this, well, relatively short period of time in this lifetime, but was it five years now or something like that? Five or six years, um, which isn't long. But having been the living barn master for that period of time, I've seen a few things. And one thing I see is that people, you can't have a split attention. You can't follow two paths at the same time. You know, if you're going to join Vardenkar, join Vardenkar. If you're going to follow Vardenkar, follow Vardenkar. If you're going to follow um, Hinduism, fine, follow Hinduism. If you're going to be a Christian, fine, be a Christian. But don't try to be a Christian and a Vardenist and a Hindu at the same time. Or try to be a Christian and a Vardenist at the same time. Or follow Jesus and be a Vardenist. Or, you know, this is... When we have cherished beliefs and opinions... They can hold us back. And this is this is a hard lesson for some people. And some people are not aware that they have opinions, but they do. And so our own attitude is an enormous factor. An enormous factor. And like I said at the beginning of this talk, we accumulate this through vast amounts of experiences and karma and reincarnation. And so it's not always easy to um, have the proper attitude. But we have to first realize that, you know, it's a little bit like the fish in the water that doesn't isn't aware of the water because it's so used to the water. We're all swimming in our own state of awareness, our own state of consciousness, and our own attitudes and our own opinions. And to the point where we don't even realize it, we begin to to think that that's reality you know it's sort of like you ask the fish how do you like the water and the fish says water what are you talking about <laughs> yeah well it's what you're in and the fish is like huh you know water what are you talking about you know somebody says um you know you're in your state of consciousness and people are like huh what do you mean so it's it's a um I don't know if I'm making the point well or, or not. But it's it's like we accumulate these these particular beliefs and feelings. And a lot of this is invisible. Um, it's in the inner. It's in the subconscious mind. It's in the emotional body, the astral body. A lot of these things form as, in, as invisible. They're not visible to the lower senses. Um but sometimes they leave clues. Now, do we have to figure out every attitude we have, every belief we have, every fear we have? No, absolutely not. That's like, I guess you'd call that part of that psychology. No, because that we all know that doesn't really work because you're just endlessly locating um, almost like glitches in the matrix, so to speak, or glitches in the computer program or fixing them. And, and it goes on forever. You know, It doesn't stop. That doesn't work. We know that. So you don't, it's not that you really, it's not that you per se fix all this nonsense. It's a matter of surrendering and following the Vardenkar program with the spiritual exercises and the true contemplation upon the works and the reading. But it's really about the spiritual exercises and, and following them. And following this Varden or this this light and sound, this audible life stream, and the inner master. And I'm not trying to summarize Vardenkar in one minute. Please don't ask me to do that. But like I said at the beginning, I guess I would say, you know, soul learns by its own volition to to move into these into these various worlds and have these their, its own personal experiences. And that's really what it's about. But in order, to, it's not always as easy as it sounds, and yet it is. And that's the paradox, is that we got to get out of our own ways. 
that's what it really comes down to is a lot of a lot of people a lot of the individuals are standing in their own way and this is just part of the process and when the individual is exceedingly grateful and is willing to let go of their cherished beliefs and opinions and dogmatic thinking when they're willing to to cease to have opinions and realize that they know nothing. And I've said this analogy a million times, but I'll say it again because it's such an important analogy. When you come to the master with a cup and it's filled with stagnant water, there's nothing the master can do. You have to dump your cup out. Or whether you want to use the analogy of a cup or you want to use the analogy of a pail of water or whatever, a bucket. But it represents your consciousness or in a crude way. And so when you're con- if your consciousness is filled with the old beliefs, the old superstitions, the old consciousness, and you come to the Master and you say, give me truth, and the Master wants to pour the living water into your bucket, and he sees well, there's muddy, stagnant water in the bucket. There's no room f- for truth. Well, I'm not, you know, the person says to the master, I'm not going to dump my bucket because I know there's water in my bucket, even though it's stagnant and smelly. At least, it, it you know, it's water. And I don't know what you're going to pour in my bucket. Maybe gasoline for all I know. So I'm not dumping the bucket out. But could you put some, just put a little bit of 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 living, breathing truth into the bucket and, you know, it'll mix with what I got in here now and I'll take a look at it and smell it and see if I notice a difference between... Well, it doesn't work that way. You can't pour um, a few ounces of of pure water into a bucket that's filled with stagnant water and expect anything good to come out of it. Some people are just really attached to their to their cherished beliefs and opinions. I guess that's why they call them cherished beliefs and opinions. And um, attachment is 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 a is something that we have to learn to be to practice vareg or detachment. And this is something that that all aspirants to God need to learn to do. It's not easy sometimes. The human mind is, is, is mechanical in nature and it tends to like to um, hold on to things. And so the mind, we don't, it's not that we're working on our mind so much as it is the mind makes a, a good servant and a poor master. So what we're really doing is we are letting the mind do what it wants to do it's sort of like Rebazar used to say to Paul that let your thoughts as you're as and he was talking about as you're doing your contemplation or spiritual exercises, let your thought thoughts drift by like barges gently floating on a on the river while you're sitting by the banks watching them float. So, you know, you can have all these weird thoughts and attitudes and negative things and positive things and all this floating through your mind. And it's not that you have to change, necessarily change your thoughts at that moment. It's that you recognize that you are soul, that you are this individual spark of God, that you're a spir- um, almost like a camera, a viewpoint, a spiritual viewpoint, a unit of awareness, that you're completely separate from your physical body and your lower bodies. That you're eternal and that the bodies are not eternal. They're really not you. They're just tools. Just like it might be frustrating to drive a car that breaks down or or acts up. The car isn't you. It's a vehicle that you're using. And so if you develop this detachment, this viewpoint of soul, then you can kind of watch and and you're not so upset when your mind has these thoughts or or your astral body has these feelings because you know that's not you. And and eventually what you learn to do is you learn to shift your attention away from from the lower bodies and you start putting them on what you want to put them on. You know, whether it's a master or golden wisdom temple on another plane, another plane, 
um, whatever it is that you're doing as, in regard to soul projection um, or, or working with the states of consciousness, you start to shift your attention and you develop this, this what's called dual awareness, you know, and you, bec and you shift more and more of your attention away from the, the lower parts, the lower bodies, you know, your thoughts, your feelings, your breathing, um, the sensation of, of your butt on the chair and all, all those other things, uh, they may not stop. Those, those, those things may not stop. But frankly, you don't care because you recognize that that's not you. And um, I get, I've given the analogy of driving a car when you have an unruly child um, in, the, in the back seat. You, you know that the child might distract you, but you, you keep your attention on the road and you keep driving. And you know that the child, all the child can do is make a lot of noise, but they're not going to stop you from driving well unless you let them distract you from the road. So, you know, when you're doing an exercise and the mind acts up or becomes unruly, you know, you just put you just put your attention away from it and know that it might not completely go away. But see, now you're letting in spirit. You're letting in the Varden, this audible life stream, you see. And that is purifying. If you're asking the masters for help and you're sincere... And you're doing your exercise, and you're doing your disc, reading your discourses, and studying and reading, and doing true contemplation upon the works. This purifying agent of the Varden is moving through you. You see, even if it's not perfect in the in the lower worlds, in the lower parts of us, it doesn't really matter because that will in time. That will in time change. And it all comes down, again, to patience and desire for God. And if the person is willing to be very patient and is willing to put up with all the testing and the dark nights of soul and the struggles and the soul searching and all these things and the doubt and the skepticism and the mind going all over the place and the emotions going all over the place, if the individual is willing to put up with that, for a given period of time and understand that it's just part of the process, then we have a chance. We have a chance. Nobody in their right mind would expect to become a doctor or a lawyer by just reading a couple of books and, and, and spending six months studying it. And yet people have this idea that they're going to find truth in a year or six months or a year and a half, just with a little bit of casual effort on their part. You know, the these things that people have been asking forever, you know, wh who am I? What am I? What is God? You know, why am I here? Um, everybody, you know, people somehow think that this stuff is, oh, you know, that, no big deal. But, you know, learning how to... Um, Become a brain surgeon, oh my gosh, you know, it's going to take years. And everybody expects that. And everybody pays accordingly. You know, the brain surgeon makes more money in one operation than some people make, you know, in six months or a year. So um, so it's kind of funny. It's it's interesting. A lot of this blame it on, I guess, blame it on religion and, and people's laziness. But most people are looking for a Santa Claus. I've talked about this. I'm not going to go back and drag it out again. But most people are looking for a space god, a, a god that will um, work with time and space and, and give them all the things they want and protect them and, and do all this stuff. They're looking for the things of this world, the emotions, the, th the feelings, the uh, physical life, health, wealth, better sex, power, prestige, elation, happiness. And, you know, I've said this before, there's nothing necessarily wrong with this, some of these things, except that, that they're not God. And so we don't have to reject them. We don't have to become poor and, and uh, unhealthy and all these things necessarily. But we do have to place God above the things of this world. So with that, I thank you for listening. 
and um, Baraka Bashad. May the blessings be.